If you have your Bibles with me, turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. We have just begun going through the book of Matthew. Uh, if you're a guest here today, uh, we like to go verse by verse and line by line. And I uh, know it's going to, we're going to be there a while in Matthew because of 28 chapters and uh, the Beatitudes and the Lord's Prayer. There are just so many things in Matthew. I just can't wait to get to. Uh, it's just great, great uh, reading and great application. Let me give you the outline if you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us. I'm speaking today on John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Number one, simple outline, the man. The man. Number two, the message. What was his message? And number three, the Messiah. And we know who the Messiah is. John the Baptist was born into a simple, obscure family. His father was Zacharias a temple priest who ministered in the temple. His mother Elizabeth was also from the priestly tribe of Levi and a descendant of Aaron, who was the first high priest. John lived in the wilderness of Judea, not having social or economic status. He was an outdoor person raised in the country, and he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. John's calling was to proclaim and to prepare the way for prepare the way for the Messiah. In doing this, Matthew 3 shows us John the Baptist as the man, the message, the motive, the mission, and the ministry of John. For over 400 years, the nation of Israel had not heard from a prophet. Things were about to change with John the Baptist's ministry. Revival was about to break out. This would get the attention of the scribes and the Pharisees. Let's look at this country preacher that was extremely bold in his witness and preaching. And by the way, it'll be shown here three times. The key word for our passage today is repent or repentant. And what that means is a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of will, and a change of behavior. And there's uh, things going around today uh, in the churches and there's a thought that simply says that all you have to do is to believe if you're going to be a Christian. But folks, passages like this tell me you must do more than just believe. Okay? What it's saying and what it is talking about is it begins with repentance. And we don't even use that word very much. But we need to repent, even in our Christian lives. We need to repent of our sins. At salvation, we need to repent. And another thing that they, they leave out many times is making Jesus Lord of your life. Folks, he needs to be Lord and Savior. And so we look at John, and he was a very different individual. Uh, matter of fact, if you looked at him from the outside, and he came to Jerusalem, and he wanted to join your church, you'd probably say, oh, I'm not sure about this. We can see in the text, he did not look like your normal uh, preacher. Matthew 3, 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He was away from Jerusalem. He was away from the temple. He was away from the scribes and Pharisees. He had his own ministry. And by the way, I want to say this. I thank God for country preachers. These guys that are, you know, don't have you know, large churches, but I am telling you, God will bless them as much, if not more, for being who they are, where they are at. You don't have to be a mega preacher. And I'm just telling you, I thank God for bivocational preachers also. And here, uh, 30 years have passed from Matthew 2 to Matthew 3. That's very important. And John's nickname was John the Baptist. And let's look at his life. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke 1. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse 5. Luke 1 verse 5 says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, 
His wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was, of the daughters of Aaron, was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. They were good people. They were righteous people. They walked with God. And this is John's parents. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. And that's the nice way of saying they were old. <laughs> all right? And I'm part of it, all right? I'm, I'm a senior adult. I'm 66 years old now, all right? So I'm, I'm with them on that. Now look in verse 11, if you would. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. And folks, if an angel appeared, you know, right beside me while I was sitting here, I would be troubled too, all right? You just, it's not a normal thing. But God had a message for Zechariah and Elizabeth. Look at verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call him John. And we know John uh, means Jehovah also. And you have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall neither, neither drink wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. So there's two things. Number one, he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord. See, we tend to want to be great in the sight of man. But boy, it is more important, folks, to be great in the sight of God. And to be filled with the Spirit is a must for Christians. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the Spirit, in the power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready for a people prepared for the Lord. So he was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. He was compared to Elijah, one of the most famous prophets in the Old Testament. Now skip down to verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came for, he delivered, for, for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. And you remember also earlier when Mary went to visit Elizabeth, all right, when they spoke, when she spoke, uh, you know, John uh, leaped in Elizabeth's stomach. Let me tell you something, folks. I'll say it to the day I die. Life begins at conception. God said, I am setting this guy apart. I am setting this baby apart. Same thing with Jeremiah. Before he was born, God said, you are going to be a prophet of mine. So we see all this going on. Now look in verse 65. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them, and these sayings were discussed throughout all the hills of Judea. And all who heard them kept them in their heart, saying, what kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Now his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, folks, John was going to be special. John was set aside for service from birth. John was called to the ministry. See, I wasn't called to the ministry until I was uh, 20 years old. John did it at birth. God called John and set him aside. So we see the hand of God on John. Now back in our text, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is used 32 times in the book of Matthew. And when you think about the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven uh, there's two things. Uh, he was talking about the present time. And what was he saying? G baby Jesus is coming. Man, Jesus is coming. The kingdom of God is coming. We know the virgin birth. We know the Christmas story. We know all that. And I'm telling you, Jesus is uh, was a carpenter, but God was preparing him. And you could tell it when he was 12 years old and he was speaking in the temple with scribes and Pharisees. So God said, 
uh, or John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his uh, path straight. Now hold your finger there and go with me to Isaiah 40. Let's look at the rest of this scripture. And it is word for word, the first part of verse 3. Isaiah 43, and the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make it straight in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain will be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight. It is a prophetic thing of what is going on, not only in John's life, because he was preaching, man, you need to be saved. Christians, you need to get right with God. He was preaching, and, and he was preaching against sin. And folks, I am telling you, uh, you know, there's not that much preaching against sin anymore. Sin is sin. God hates sin. We don't need sin in our lives. It pulls us down. It weights us down. And sometimes we are ineffective because of sin. And it says, the crooked places shall be straight and the rough places smooth. And it could also be a reflection of the tribulation time. Think of this. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed for all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. Could that not be talking about the millennium period also? That thousand year reign here on earth where, where Jesus is going to reign from the city of David. That perfect time. And it says, the voice cry out. And he said, why shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. I had a just a great moment Thursday night. And you know what it was? I mowed my grass. <laughs> you say, well, why is that great? Because the frost came. And I'm not going to have to mow my grass anymore. <laughs> I was happy. But you know what they're literally saying? He's saying, listen, folks, we're just grass. You're not living forever. You don't have as much time as you think you have. So what you need to do is listen to the Word of God. My Bible says now is the day of salvation. Now we need to get our hearts right with God. Folks, if you look over at Israel and all that is going on in the countries that are turning against them, if you will look, and, and again, folks, uh, you know, the election and all that's going on, God is going to get the person in that God wants in. Okay? It's a God thing. We need to vote. We need to vote. But I'm simply saying God has a plan and Jesus is coming. The rapture of the church, I believe, is the next thing on God's prophetic calendar. Why? Because the Word of God says so. So now let's look at verse 4. Now John himself was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. I bet he was fit and trim. Man, I'm not sure I could put a locust in my mouth, even with honey on it. All right? Then Jerusalem and all of Judea, all the region around the Jordan went out uh, to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And it's talking about the Jordan River. It's talking about him peeping preaching repentance. And there was indications in other texts that I read that you would not be saved if you had not repented of your sins. And so there's this thing going out. You know, it wasn't in Jerusalem. It wasn't where the population was. But literally hundreds of people were going and they were hearing about John and someone even, some called him John the Baptizer. And this was going on, and I'm telling you, revival broke out. Revival broke out. And, and even the, the ones, the scribes and the Pharisees, 
showed up. So we see John the man. He was a preacher, preaching in the wilderness, telling everyone, man, you get right with God. You invite Jesus into your life. Your life needs to change. People need to see a difference in your life. So we see the man, and now let's look at the message. Verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? See, this is part of why I believe, you know, you know some people have in, interpreted that the uh, scribes and Pharisees were being baptized, but I don't believe that's what it's saying. They just came out to see what was going on. Folks, when something's going on, uh, you, know, uh, you know, another thing the media has done, you haven't heard anything about these things that are going on on college campuses. Hundreds of people are being saved at rallies, but it's not covered. Why? Because, the, the, yeah, the world don't want it to happen. Man, when college kids, folks, th these are intelligent people. These are people that give their life, and they're going to be our next working crew. And folks, if we could see this and pray for these things, and literally in, in some campuses, thousands were saved. Amen. We ought to be shouting that from the rooftop. But it's not politically correct. Well, let me tell you something. I don't want to be politically correct. I want to be biblically correct. Amen. What does the Bible say? Folks, we better get ready. We, I am not a doomsday preacher. I'm a realist, folks. And it's in my bones. I'm telling you, it's just something. When it gets in my bones, I, you know, I'm just telling you, be ready. Sadducees, coming to his baptism, said to them, brute of vipers. You know what he was saying? You're a bunch of snakes. <laughs> vipers are snakes. All right? I mean, Paul, remember he got bit by one. Nothing happened to him because when you get bit by a viper, you are going to die. So, so John carefully said, listen, you guys are bums. You, you have your robes on. You come out and you, you know, pray on the street corners. You do all these things, but you take advantage of widows. You can't take advantage of people. You act like you're better than everybody else. Don't come out here and mess my revival up. I mean, that's what he was saying. Who warned you to flee from the wrath? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. He said it again. If you don't want to repent, don't come. Folks, that's bold preaching. He wouldn't be on TV today. Why? He tells too much truth. All right? And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Oh, folks, that was the deal in that day. Because they were born with a Jewish heritage, and they were God's chosen people, some thought, hey, we're going to heaven just because we're Jews. The Bible shows that's not seen in the Word of God. I don't care if your daddy's a preacher, a deacon, or teaches a Sunday school class. That has nothing to do with your salvation. According to the Word of God, we have to come God's way. For I say to you, that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And what is he saying? Here's what I believe the interpretation is, that their hearts were made of stones, that they have already rejected the Messiah, okay? And he was just simply saying, you, you are wasting your time. You don't decide when you get saved. God calls you to salvation. And they were more worried about their appearance. They were more, more worried about being more righteous than someone else. Folks, when are we going to quit looking at one another and judging one another and trying to figure out who's spiritual and who's not? Let me help you today. We're all not spiritual in some sense. We all have shortcomings. But that doesn't need, mean we need to stay that way. These folks... John was just simply saying, man, y'all need to change. And unless you change, you will not spend an eternity with God. Look at verse 10. Even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. 
Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What good is a fruit tree if it doesn't bear fruit? And you can say maybe a little shade, but it's still taking the place of where you could plant a new fruit tree and have fruit. And he's just saying, you say the right things, you do some of the right things, but there is no fruit in your life. And he says, you might as well take an ax and chop that tree down because you are not saved, is what he is saying. Therefore, every tree which does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. And, and he is simply telling us, folks, we have to look at this. We have to understand, folks, this is John's message. Folks, salvation hasn't changed. From Genesis to Revelation, it speaks of salvation. And we do not need to change the Word of God. We do not need to give our opinions about salvation. It is clear. You have to come to Christ. You, you have to uh, ask for forgiveness of your sins. You need to repent of your sins. And that is the message. And so we see the man, and we see the message. And the last thing I want you to see is the Messiah. Look at verse 11. Indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. What is he saying? He said, yes, I baptize you water, but with water, but it's in the Jordan River. And we know that baptism was a thing of identification. The Holy Spirit came down at the day of Pentecost. Peter got up and preached a straight salvation message. 3,000 people got saved. And the Bible says those that received Christ gladly were baptized. And so we identify. We identify church membership by baptism. And folks, I'm just telling you, uh, you know, we have to do it the way God says. He says, be baptized. And again, the word baptism literally means immersed. I'm not trying to put anybody's religion down, but I'm just telling you, Baptists don't take sprinkles. It's, it's not a sprinkle. When someone dies, you don't sprinkle dirt on them. You put them all the way under. And the, the, the uh, <laughs> I really didn't mean that to be funny. <laughs> I mean, you put some dirt on them, but I'm just saying, you don't just sprinkle a little dirt on them. Let me rephrase that. But even baptism is a picture of a death. Mike Franklin walked into that water. Mike Franklin died to Mike Franklin. Mike Franklin now serves God and serves Jesus with all his heart. And we're buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk to the newness of life. See, John, forerunner of Jesus, was initiating uh, scriptural baptism, folks. So we can see how important that is. And then he mentions Jesus, he, and he's just simply saying, you know, I know there are a lot of folks out here. I know right now I'm a popular guy, but I can't hold a light to Jesus. All right? Me neither, folks. I can't either. He was the perfect son of God. But do you know what it showed? It showed humility in John's life. If there's something this world is missing, it's humility. Folks, we are so proud. Our athletes, are you kidding me? $60 million a year to play football? Folks, we must humble ourselves before God. It doesn't matter what you make. Every one of us are going to stand before God one day. The rest of that verse, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. And we know when the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Jesus left. The Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, clovens of fire. But it's, that's not what he is talking about there, in my opinion. The Holy Spirit baptizes us when we get saved. The minute we repent of our sins and invite Christ into our lives, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, and it's with us all the time. Now, there's a difference in having the Holy Spirit and a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Everyone that says is saved has the Holy Spirit. But manifestation 
has to do with the filling of the Spirit. Being fired up for Christ. But you know what I think the fire means? I think it's talking about judgment. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you will stand before God. And fire, uh, especially in Revelation, speaks of judgment. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will be burned. He will burn up the chaff in its unquenchable fire. And I've never been a farmer. I was born in Lawton, Oklahoma. Lived there for my first 36 years. I've lived here uh, for the years, you know, the 30 now. And so, you know, I don't know thoroughly what went on, you know, in in the separation. Okay, apparently some did it by wheel. They'd have a wheel and they'd smash of the grain and, and it would separate that way and they would pile that up. And then when the wind blew, they threw it up and the chaff was light because it wasn't a part of the seed. And the chaff would just blow away. And so the seed, what he really wanted, was still left there. And it really is talking also about Matthew 25 when there is a separation of the sheep and the goats. It's going to happen, folks. All right? You, you're not going to plead your case at the judgment seat of Christ. What you must do, you have to do down here while you are alive. And so John is just simply saying, and he knew there was lost people in the group. He didn't care if he was offending somebody. He was simply preaching the word of God. We will all stand before God. But the question I have to ask myself is, what was, what was John, what, what was his whole deal? I mean, in that day, you know, they compared him to Elijah. In that day, matter of fact, just shortly before this scripture that I'm fixing to read, he was in prison. And if you remember, he just said, hey, he sent a message and said, hey, tell Jesus, you know, is he the true Messiah or is he not? Folks, even Christians have some doubting times. But he said, and Jesus told him this, go tell him that the lame are walking, the blind are seeing. God is doing a work in the lives of people. People are being saved. People are uh, being changed. Revival broke out in that first century church. And John, I'm just telling you, was, you know, for who he was, uh, the limited scope that he had, he walked everywhere he went. He didn't have a huge population uh, you know, around him, I'm telling you, listen to what God, what God and Jesus said about John. Matthew chapter 11. Look at Matthew 11. Matthew 11, verse 9. And this is Jesus speaking. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he whom is written... Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Being the forerunner of Jesus Christ, he said this, Assuredly, I say to you, and this is Jesus' word, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. He was humble. He was faithful. He preached the truth. He lived the, live uh, the Christian life. He wasn't afraid of the scribes and Pharisees. He wasn't worried about how much money he made or who was there or the criticism that he had. Jesus, man, I wish, oh, wouldn't, you know, for, you know, all I'm looking for, all right, because I know I'm not the greatest, you know, there's no doubt in my mind about that. I just want to hear God say, thank you, my good and faithful servant. And the Bible says, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And then he kind of just, you know, was just basically saying, folks, God loves everyone. But the Christians, you know, that he's going to take to heaven, I am just telling you, folks, they are the one that has the peace of God in their lives. They are the ones that has that assurance. Steve, when we sang, when we close, or, or excuse me, Denise, when we sang, we close our eyes in death. Folks, I am telling you, there's two things that I am looking forward to, either the rapture of the church or just passing from life to death. 
Folks, it's graduation day. It is graduation day. The last scripture I want to read is Matthew verse 28. You say, Brother Mike, what, what are you all fired up about? Well, I'm fired up about we should be like John. We should be like John the baptizer. Everyone needs to know Jesus is coming soon. Everyone needs to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others around them. Matthew 28, and I close, and he came and spoke to them. Jesus saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, G-O, not sit, not soak, not sour. Go, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them discipleship to observe all things that I have commanded you. And here's the promise, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Can I say this to the Christian? You can't mess it up. If you've got a Bible in your hand, you can't mess it up. It's the Word of God. Father, thank you for John the baptizer. Thank you for John the Baptist. And God, I pray, and I, I thank you for his boldness. God, I thank you that Lord, he just told it like it was. He wasn't rude. He wasn't mean. God, the Spirit of God was on him. And God, I pray that we as Christians would be that way, that we would be bold in our witness. And God, we would have our Bibles in our hands. And God, we'd invite people to church. And God, the, the, the day is coming, Lord. Jesus is coming soon. And if we're going to do something for God, I believe we have to do it now. So God, thank you for John the Baptist and his example. And God, I just pray, Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know you, they would realize that there is a judgment day. Everybody will stand before God. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would just touch their heart and let them know today would be a beautiful day to accept you to repent of their sin, for you to change them, and they give their heart and life to Christ. Lord, if there's Christians that need to rededicate their life, if there's people here that need to be baptized, we're going to look at the baptism of Jesus next week. And it's important. It's important that you follow the Lord in baptism. So God, if there's others who want to join this church, they know who we are, they know what we're about. And God, if, if they are Christians, if they have been baptized, God, we will welcome them with open arms. God, this is your invitation. This is your church. You do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoke to you, would you come?